Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, tonight's event, Iraq and the Geopolitics of Protest. Of course, at a very timely time uh, when not just in Iraq, but Lebanon, uh, other countries in the region, we've recently been seeing a uh, new, I don't know if you should say, round of protests. Uh, question of whether, you know, they're similar or different to the Arab Spring. What are they about? What's happening in these countries? Today's talk, of course, will be on Iraq specifically, but of course, uh, will have implications if we want to think more regionally, if we want to think of Lebanon, if we want to think of issues of sectarianism, identity, religion, uh, and geopolitics, regional geopolitics, you know, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, international uh, affairs, and uh, the role of international <coughs> actors in the, in, in the region. United States, uh, and we're, we're very uh, happy to have uh, Professor Hassan Abbas with us uh, today. Uh, Professor Abbas is a dear friend, colleague, and senior advisor uh, on uh, our project on Shiism and Global Affairs here at Harvard University's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Uh, Hassan Abbas is a distinguished professor of international relations at the Near East South Asia uh, Strategic Studies Center at the National Defense University. Uh, he has uh, published widely on uh, geopolitics uh, in South Asia and the Middle East. Uh, his uh, recent book uh, was uh, just published last year uh, entitled Pakistan's Nuclear Bomb, A Story of Defiance, uh, Deterrence, and Deviance. And he uh, also published a book on the Taliban uh, revival uh, as an expert on uh, 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 geopolitical and security issues and civil military relations uh, in Afghanistan, uh, uh, South Asia, and, and, and Middle East. And of course, uh, one of his reports that uh, we very much highlighted as part of our project is on Iraq's Hashim <coughs> Shah, basically you know, the popular mobilization forces in Iraq. Uh, so we're very, let's welcome uh, Professor Abbas to Thank you. speak on Iraq and the geopolitics of protests, and then we'll continue with uh, Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure and, and honor to be here. It's a great pleasure to return to this town um, where I lived for nine years uh, in my beginning my academic journey in the United States many, many years ago, in 2001. So it's, it's a real pleasure and honor. Um, the way I want to frame the issues is first giving you an overview from a layman's point of view. Uh, just looking at five or different ways in what is obvious to us or obvious to any observer of Iraq or how people based on open source knowledge, open source information are looking at this issue. That this is the frame. One, two, three, four, five. These are the five big things. Because anyone who's not following, for instance, Iraq or, 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 or region per se, we often confuse, we judge um, these kind of post protests by how many number of people killed. Um, and of course, we forget. Uh, in this case, we often mention, and rightly so, and with every single life matters, but it is said 320 killed, 15,000 uh, injured. Well, in this country, Iraq, 15 years, 16 years ago, there were 1 million dead. So we are, we are talking about uh, a country which has gone through hell. Uh, which has gone through a very high rate of terrorist activity, political um, crisis. Um, so, unfortunately, tragedy, crisis is something which is uh, very indigenous, uh, if I, or very local, or, or a real reality on the ground. So that's why it is important at times. Um, just yes, if you look at uh, number of people killed in protest in Iraq and compare it with Lebanon, um, Egypt, um, any other place, yes, that, that, those contexts differ. So the purpose of giving you first just the five facts, so to say, is to frame the issue as everyone will look at it. That's number one. Then I'll go a bit deeper um, and I'll try to explain six or seven major factors, um, which I would say are a deeper level analysis or what is not visible. <coughs> 
or what various scholars, experts, uh, observers of Iraq view, that no, this is not the real thing what we are seeing. Um, and this is just an anecdote. I mean, I was talking to um, a leading Iraqi American um, who, who's uh, from an important political family. Uh, just last night, uh, I think I was mentioning this earlier to Payam. I asked him, um, actually last night, I said, Sayyid, I'm going to uh, uh, Boston to talk about it. Maybe I'm missing something. Um, it's your country, can you just share with me some of the ideas? How do you view this? What is happening? Who's behind it? And as soon as he said, you tell me the facts first. When I mentioned to him five facts, his immediate thing was, and I was generally framing it as it's a freedom struggle. It's, it's, it's a very courageous of young Iraqis to come out on the street, demand freedom, demand accountability, demand action against corruption. And he said, well, have you seen their posters, the way it is happening in such a choreographed fashion? Who's paying for it? And I said, oh, yeah, that's the second level analysis. Um, who's paying for it? If it is, somebody's paying for it. So that's the purpose, a deeper um, dive. Um, I mean, what is not immediately visible? What are the five, six major theories of what is happening? That, that's the plan. And then um, the last, I'll talk about where I think this will go and what this means for us in America or what this means for US policy. So these are the three uh, stages which I'll go through right in the introduction. And this I'm only mentioning uh, to, to explain my lens um, that I am a frequent traveler to Iraq. Um, the day these protests started, I was in Baghdad actually for a conference to speak um, to Iraqi police and Iraqi law enforcement. I was giving as a part of a very important um, think tank in Iraq called, uh, it's, it's based on I'm focusing on a dialogue between different communities uh, uh, in, in uh, it's called Rafidan Center for Dialogue. Uh, and they had invited speakers from across the world, I was tasked to give, um, a, to organize a workshop for the Iraqi police and intelligence to help them think about security sector reform, how Iraqi police can do better. Um, and right after we finished, uh, I was moving towards Najaf and uh, we realized rather than one hour, it is taking us three hours. And they said, oh, all the ropes are blocked. That was the beginning. I was there till three days in Karbala and a few days in Najaf. So I, uh, watched this um, at the peak of the crisis and a chance to visit some universities, give a couple of lectures, talk to young Iraqis. And, and I learned um, whenever you really want to uh, dig deeper into these issues, the, the best way, of course, is to be in the field. In this case, I was lucky. I went for a different reason. So I'll share some of my thoughts based on what I heard from ordinary people in Iraq, uh, what my assumptions are. And I, where I'm a professor at the as a National Defense University, um, I have times um, trained to or, or required to think from a pure security lens um, from a US policy point of view. Um, and what I've learned is now that there are um, so many different frames through which you can look at these issues. So that, that's uh, an effort uh, that uh, I will undertake um, today. As regards time, I should ma'am go for about 20 more minutes or 20, 30 minutes. As, as you feel. Okay. Um, so I'll take maybe go for about 20, 25 minutes and, um, and then, then we'll go to question answers. And when I thought about um, explaining uh, what's happening on the ground, I promise you, I'll talk about five issues which are on the ground. I thought there's no better way to explain how people are looking at it, but look at some of the pictures and tweets and posters that are um, being projected on the streets. Uh, these are, I have my own pictures. Uh, but I'm using those mostly from Twitter, uh, from credible sources, um, those journalists, those Iraqis, mostly. All the pictures uh, that I'll show you, or all the tweets that I'll show you are by most, in most cases, are from local Iraqis. This is how Iraq is looking at this issue. So let me quickly go through some slides just to show you these tweets and these pictures, and then I'll try to uh, summarize these. Um, so actually, uh, this picture as well, the first one, um, that picture is available, but this is how some people are framing it on the ground. You can see, M goes out, Iraq comes in. Um, immediate passage. Um, it's it's all about Iranian influence in Iraq, and we somebody or the ordinary Iraqi is kicking out M and bringing it Iraq. So this is all about nationalism. This is all about Iraqi nationalism and Iraqi sovereignty. Some people are framing it. It's. Uh, these two tweets, very quickly, stay with me for some time reading this. Let, let's start from that one. Uh, we are a generation born in your wars, spent our childhood in your terrorism, our adolescence is your sectarianism, and our youth is your corruption. 
We are the generation of stolen dreams and premature aging. Um, that's very visible. Young, young people who are coming on the streets. And this is a poster from the, from the protests. Uh, this is not some Western liberal uh, young person who there's nothing bad to be in Western liberal. Uh, what I'm saying is this is, this is local indigenous. Um, here, we are neither infiltrators nor Reuters. We are the children of the country. The homeland, our mother truth is our voice and peace is our weapon. Sounds very good and sounds very progressive. Um, next point, stage, don't fight the regime using arms, for it's certainly armed. Fight it with ideas. It's got none. Um, I think that too is true. Um, because we are seeing that different parties came into power since 2003. And for the ordinary Iraqi, um, they have nothing. I'll give you an anecdote. I was, when I was in this cab going from our cars that a friend has sent from Baghdad to Najaf. Um, my driver, who I knew from previous experience because you travel with those who, who you trust, he was visibly down. He was very down and very, and I said, I thought, He's not well or something, and he said, yeah, my, my son is in uh, very, very ill, his 18-year-old son, for the last three, four days. And I said, have you gone to the doctor? Have you taken him to the doctor? He looked at me and he said, hospitals are for the rich. And the kind of misery and pain in his voice was so obvious, and he worked with a very important company. I'm sure he was paid very well. And he said, I can't afford it. And I said, so, I mean, all those pilgrims, everyone was going, we are hearing Iraq is building two huge three hospitals. I know the Kazwinis, the two religious scholars, we have been the family, very renowned, very respected family of Shia scholars based in United States. In, and I, I know I, I visited the, the hospital. It's a, it's a marvelous hospital that's being built in Karbala. I mentioned to him, he, last visit, he had taken me to some of those hospitals. He said, sir, we are not supposed to go to that hospital. They, those are not for us. And I, so I can see. The ordinary people who are looking for a new Iraq, they can't even afford to take their kids to hospital. Uh, so that, that is reality. So I just am giving one fact just to explain uh, that the, these voices are very real. I could associate with those voices. Um, yes, then the other thing was, uh, why this was the third or the fourth day that people started saying that? Because, and this is another element of the reality. I'm still in my first part, five major facts. What is happening on the ground? That state reacted to all this the way all states in Middle East and elsewhere react. Very brutal response. On the first very day, you had about 15, 20 people dead. Second day, 40, 60 people dead. Most of the people thought it's not possible. Um, so many people dead. Because normally on the state side as well, law enforcement, military, uh, they, they take time to strategize. The first reaction is, okay, try to understand what's happening, push back, uh, close the streets, under the standard security procedures. Um, in this case, on the very first day, there was a strong reaction. The protesters were saying, no, look, we are not here on behalf of somebody. We, we, we are talking about ideas. Um, two others um, from Iraq demonstration sign board, those who, who are scared will never make freedom. So yes, people, Local people are framing it as, as democracy, liberty, freedom. Um, and then the other ones, that was very insightful. Sign on, it says, no America, no Erdogan, no Saudi, no Iran, no Baad, no Barzan, no to Israeli intelligence outlets peddling fake secularism. That, that's also uh, a view because all these forces are very, very active. Um, if for a second I jump, which I should have waited for my next, the deeper dive, but just to explain why this is very relevant. Very few people know, in the last six to eight months, there were 18 Israeli strikes in Iraq. Uh, targeted killing of some people in some cases. Uh, others, ammunition depots, which are supported by Iran. These were some by some uh, local non-state military actors who were organizing their, their, their weapons. And um, Israelis targeted those directly. There's a big debate in Iraq the Iraqi government, what I'm saying is really the Iraqi government has not concluded that. Or I should say they have not uh, announced it, their investigations. People are, I was in this conference in Baghdad and Hadi Lamri, the head of the, one of the important political factions was with us. And Hadi Lamri said that openly, publicly. We have many people in front of him. He's, he was asked, he's, he's, for those who don't know Iraq, um, he's leader of one of the most important political factions or political alliance who is currently uh, their representative, Adil Abdul Mehdi, is the Prime Minister. 
And Hadir Amri was asked directly by a questioner, uh, what do you think? Uh, who attacked these strikes on ammunition depots? What happened? Who, who did it? He, know, he knows very well. It is uh, uh, Israeli. Very, everyone knows in Iraq, I guess. And he said, we don't know. Um, that's the price of being in government. Uh, he wanted to be very politically correct. For some reason, they don't want to escalate. I'm just giving an example. On this, so for ordinary people, it's not only about Iran, it's about United States, it's about Saudi. Um, another quick anecdote about, I think, uh, a year ago, um, I was going to Iraq for another conference, and I dealt, say, in Baghdad, when we were trying to book a hotel, they said, no, all hotels are booked. And I said, I know Najaf and Karbala, because there are so many Zaireens, so many pilgrims. In the heavy season, pilgrimage season, it's very difficult to get a room booked in a good hotel, or in any hotel, for, 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 uh, for that matter. Baghdad is not the case. And I was told when I called in a friend in government, and he said, no, all hotels in Saudi Arabia, in uh, all hotels in uh, Baghdad are booked by the Saudis. Saudis booking all the hotels in Baghdad? They said, yes, there's a big conference because there's an understanding uh, which is now public. The view was previously that Saudis are funding ISIS, etc., etc. And the counter argument was that when the Iraqis said to Saudis, look, now we have pushed back ISIS, um, the Sunni majority areas, uh, we want you to come and actually invest and restructure and build infrastructure in that area. So Saudis agreed. So this was a big fair investment conference which Saudis businessmen and traders, they came um, to, to Baghdad and that was the conference I'm talking about. So for ordinary people, this, there are many people, Sunnis were waiting. Oh, the Saudi money is coming, they will build schools, they will build hospitals in the Sunni majority areas. So we often hear only about one side. So Iranian influence, perceived influence in Karbala and Najaf, uh, Saudi influence in certain parts, Saudi or other extremist influence in certain areas. So that's what how people ordinarily view this. That that's the context of this this slide. Then, have any one of you had a chance to see this picture before? This is this is the mode of operation. This new revolution, if I call that, or major protest. These are these uh, what we call in South Asia rickshaws, uh, but these small vehicles which are actually um, running the new. Um, protest movement. Um, if you are hurt, if you are injured, taking you to a hospital. Uh, this was the case where they said we, we want to spread peace and they said we'll, this one day we'll actually bring all these white uh, message of peace and love. Um, but this, the, 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 the commute, the transportation, the mode of communication, the network of these protests are through these TikToks because they can, uh, they can go through um, heavy streets and everywhere else. This is a symbol of, of this new protest, this, this mode of transportation. Um, also then some pictures to give you, um, maybe the fourth point I have, this top picture became very popular because that's a security guard uh, or a security person who was supposed to <coughs> go and um, uh, take care of the protests, push back. Uh, but his son also followed him. His son was a protester. So at the end of the day, he's resting and his son is resting. Uh, so they are both father and son uh, are opposite the son. I mean, I mean from, I guess from the, the picture, maybe 12, 14, 15 years of age. Um, and th this this was very popular in Iraq for a day, explaining um, what's happening in, in Iraq. Um, this one, I can translate it. I should have the translation up. Um, at the top, uh, which, which says, um, we are not Shi'i, we are not Sunni, we are not Christian, we are all Iraqi. Um, th that was a consistent message. Again, very strange for many people. We have seen Iraq in the last 15, 16 years in terms of the sectarianism, uh, in terms of massive uh, terrorist attacks uh, against the pilgrims, the Shias, against a lot of um, massive military action in Sunni areas, the Shia Sunni pushback in Baghdad, the killings, you know that. You, I'm sure you, this, is, uh, th this was in the news um, for the last 12, 13 years. So up front, this group, the protesters are saying, we are not framing ourselves as Christian, Shia, Sunni, Muslim, non-Muslim. And, and uh, uh, on her face, the, uh, the slogan is, is about Vatan. Uh, it's about nationalism, Iraqi state, new sovereign Iraqi state. That, that's the message that most people um, are, are giving. Then I come to one stage deeper, um, which is, so Iran wants the US to leave Iraq 
and the US wants Iran to leave Iraq. Perhaps our presence is inconveniencing them. So how about we leave Iraq? Uh, so that, that, that's the, the young Iraqi uh, who's seeing Iran uh, and who's seeing United States battle. And this, by the way, I, many people that I talk to, among the scholars, and I'll come to that when I talk to politicians or religious scholars, um, th that, that's the feeling I get. That the biggest worry in Najaf, and I had the great honor to meet uh, all the four um, are leading in Najaf al Maraje, as they call the four big Ayatollahs um, Ayatollah Sistani, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid al Hakim, Ayatollah Bashir Najafi, and uh, Ayatollah Ishaq. Um, by the way, how many of you had ever heard about these four, four names? I mean, we are often hear only Sistani, the other names are also many of you. These are all very important. It, it, for a minute, um, if I will, one case for later on to go for my deeper dive. Uh, it's very interesting. This is Najaf, uh, the top cleric, Ayatollah Sistan. They have all four Maraji, the four big Ayatollahs. They have their own um, institutions, seminaries, um, a whole system of charity, a whole system of religious seminaries. Ayatollah Sistan, the word Sistan, it's Sistan is in Iran. He is Iranian roots. Ayatollah Muhammad Sayyid, Sayyid al Hakim uh, is an Arab from the Hakim family. Third, Bashir Najfi. Who will tell me where Bashir Najfi is from? Pakistan. He's from Pakistan. Um, he speaks excellent Urdu uh, and, uh, and Hindi and uh, bit Punjabi as well. And then Ayatollah Ishaq, who's he? He's Hazara from Afghanistan. Um, it's very interesting how the religious clergy, religious establishment um, is quite diverse, but I'll come to that a bit later. But even among the religious scholars and others, they were saying this for the last one year. They were saying, we think that our, that Iraq is moving towards some stability, but we are worried that this is a battleground for the United States and Iran. And we are really concerned, how are we going to um, f deal with this situation? Uh, will, we able, will we be able to ever escape from this, this, this crisis? Um, that, that was one other serious concern um, in, in this regard. Erdogan, this is from an Iranian website. Um, so this is what Erdogan says. Uh, Erdogan in his first remarks about the Iraqi people's revolution, we know who's behind the protests. And we believe that the scheme of protests in Iraq will extend to Iran. Tensions in Iraq are aimed at tearing apart the Islamic nation. He's, he's already, actually, uh, yesterday he was in White House. Um, I don't know what he was doing, his own po political um, balancing, but he's throwing it at the United States. This I showed you previously as well. Actually, this is the one I wanted to show you. This is uh, the, the exact translation. It's prohibited to use sectarian words. Um, they, they're clearly telling protesters, no, we, they, they, this is the law, this is the rule uh, or for, for these protests. No sectarian identities. Um, this I will leave for my later analysis. So these were the five, six major themes that are very obvious to me uh, and to anyone. Um, and before I go deeper into this whole notion of what is really behind all this, um, is it something else which, that we are missing? I'll mention a couple of other things. One is that analysts, scholars are linking all of this to, is it <coughs> part of the larger protest movement that we are seeing in Middle East, uh, the Arab Spring uh, had happened? Uh, in 2010-11, then there were other small incidences, and then there were actually, since 2010, there were major, 10 major series of protests um, from Iraq, of course, to Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Yemen, Bahrain, um, and even in Morocco, but Libya uh, primarily as well. So is this part of that? And, and this was a question that was asked uh, to me by one of the young Harvard students earlier today in a podcast. And I, I was mentioning this to him as well. I think no, this um, this is this is very different. Uh, all the previous or even parallel movements that we are seeing, or protest movements that we are seeing, were all um, against authoritarianism. Those were all against major, big, well-known dictators or authoritarian leaders. This is happening where is at least we, Iraq is transitioning through a democratic order. It's trying to make sense of this new democratic space that they have. So it is a more <coughs> mature effort. Uh, I, I think 
Iraqis are showing more maturity in terms of what they're asking for. They're asking for accountability. They're asking for transparency. They're asking for a clear constitutional setup. I mean, these are very clearly through posters, through statements that are coming. So it is different from what we have observed in the Middle East. Um, secondly, I think what is again very obvious is, uh, this is no second layer, deeper analysis is needed to see. It is non-sectarian. This is the first time what is happening in Iraq has no sectarian undertones. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues in, in Baghdad, when I asked him what's happening, he said, it's a Shia civil war. It's a really Shia civil war, who's fighting whom? And I'll come to that in the second stage. But no one so far has called it a Shia Sunni, Baathist, something Kurdish. So this is in some ways about their Sunnis involved in it. I think I'm not saying it's only Shias who are on the street. There's so many Kurds and uh, Sunnis <coughs> are there. But it, it is almost has a sign of an anti-sectarianism flavor to it, which is unique. I mean, these are the people who have gone through this horrible um, series of massacres for a variety of, uh, from a variety of actors. And this is not talking about 100 years ago. This is just 20 years ago, or actually within the last 20 years, I should say, since 2003, the last 16, 17 years. And for this community, the Iraqis, to come out of this and say, no, no, we are against sectarianism. Because the, uh, the, the pain and the suffering of sectarianism is very fresh. People who have lost their family members, it's very hard. If you've lost a cousin even or a family member uh, in a sectarian attack, and for you to come up and stand out, I mean, you, I'm sure you see uh, all the big news we often uh, in media in America today. Um, someone who's gone through tragedy, when they stand up and say, um, no, we actually, yes, my family member was killed, or my daughter was kidnapped, but I'll start a new, this new app. Um, who, to help people find the kidnapped, for, for us Americans to come as, together as a community. We consider them heroes. You know, that's what Iraqis are doing in big numbers. Uh, that's not recognized by anyone in media at least at this time. But that, that's another thing which to me is, is very obvious. The protesters' demands I've already talked about. One thing which is, was not visible in my first few slides as, as regards what's happening, uh, which is obvious, is this also this element of fear um, from these attacks, sniper attacks, because after first week it was obvious or it was projected that Iraqi state is not directly involved in these killings. They are not using uh, hardcore military tactics. These are some other snipers who come from dark corners, their faces covered, they kill, and they kill, they shoot to kill. Police often is trained, if I wear my security hat for a second. Most law enforcement agencies are trained when they shoot, they don't shoot to kill, they shoot to disperse. Because that's, you don't, you want people to be scared. Oh, what if I'm hit? You want them to leave the scene. They, they want the parents to tell their kids, don't go tomorrow, where well, it's risky. In this case, and only military, uh, when in uh, insurgency situation, when they use their bullets, they're asked at the end of the day, use, use 10 bullets, where are the 10 bodies? That's a very, very military, a conflict side of operation. So many people thought, so who is this who, who are killing people? And that created some fear, but Iraqis are still coming out very, very regularly. Uh, so these were the five, six things um, which are obvious. Now let me go um, to what I promised, a deeper dive. Um, so is it really, number one, um, five, first five, those points which people are trying to project. Um, one person I interviewed in the United States um, said to me, this is reaction to what Iranians did in Saudi Arabia. Their oil refineries, their oil refinery was hit um, through drone strikes, actually through direct missiles as well. Uh, United States government has taken a clear position on that, saying that this was Iranian, uh, 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 direct Iranian action. This is being debated. But the, the, the argument or the theory is that the Saudis were hit. They, their, uh, their, their capacity to refine oil, 50% of that capacity was destroyed. They will probably, it will, in some cases, it will take some time. Uh, that, that's not a small thing um, for Saudi Arabia and for United States, which is uh, United uh, Saudi Arabia is a very important US ally. Uh, for Saudi Arabia to take such a big hit and do nothing. So one theory is um, this is in fact uh, the first picture that I had shown you that Iran is pushed out and Iraq is there. The theory is Saudi Arabia uh, has a network. Saudi Arabia is. Uh, funding this, um, some say Israelis, um, and that 
again they are mentioning those 18 strikes. The word 18 strikes, if you just do a search engine, you'll not find it anywhere. You'll find three or four attacks. But a senior Iraqi official told me, it's not four or five. It's I, I thought there's seven or eight maybe. Uh, I was thinking I'll, if I am, I'm able to convince him that there were seven attacks, I'll have something new. He said 18 attacks. Um, so some people are thinking, is it is it something like that? Because Israel is concerned and they want to push back Iran. Uh, that, that's one other theory. The um, among the other major theories is um, that this is a normal organic effort which is inspired by what's happening in Lebanon, what's happening in other parts in the region, um, in Syria in some shape or form, but yes, what's happening in Hong Kong, other cases in the world that we know of, but most closely uh, are impacted by these protest movements, especially in Lebanon. Uh, uh, because there are many Shias are also on the streets, so people thought that there's a close linkage. Um, that's the other, that's the third major theory, uh, that it, it's that's what's happening. Then the fourth one is about, um, and I'll quote from this, um, so Ayatollah Sistani, um, he, he, he speaks through the Friday sermons. If you want to hit, one is the sistani.org, but if you want to really understand what's happening from the Najaf point of view, Najaf is a very important center. Uh, as a background, I'll only mention in, um, the uh, student of Iraqi history will tell you, 1920s, um, when the British was pushed out, there was a major fatwa from Najaf. Every major, like uh, the uh, pushing back on, on um, Hashtar Shah, uh, pushing back of uh, ISIS, Hashtar Shabi, the Shia militia, some people call it, the, uh, these non armed, these non state armed groups, uh, they don't like the word militia at all. Um, I, I have interviewed many of them, traveled with some of those in my research. And they, they really reacted that I think they're right because they, they mentioned that this was created as a result of a fatwa uh, or a religious edict from Ayatollah Sistani, which said, We want volunteers to go and fight ISIS. So, Friday sermon is normally the way the message comes from Sistani. And he said, he gave a few statements. His last Friday sermon, or, the, or just before that, said, uh, because this, these protests are becoming an arena for score settling between some international and regional countries. And so they were, and recently also, then Ayatollah Sistani had mentioned, we don't, they, they were not saying end the protests. He's actually being seen as uh, supporting protests in some shape or form, or at least uh, not discouraging them, but telling them, we want you to continue to raise voice for constitutionalism, for uh, political equality, uh, for transparency, and especially about corruption. <coughs> Sistani's office has been very clear on that. Uh, very <coughs> unique in the Muslim world, um, in many ways, keeping aside the kind of sectarian uh, identities involved. So that's one theory, that uh, this is a battle between, this is I'm kind of in my deeper dive fourth point, um, that this is, is this a Sistani versus Khamenei phenomenon? And I can give an example. I've seen this myself. Um, Iranian uh, pilgrims would come. They would have big banners. And this is not based on one or two trips, not that I'm uh, overly uh, emphasizing my trips, but this is based on my about 10 or 12 trips in the last three, four years. Iranian pilgrims will come with big posters, uh, banners, which will have Ayatollah Khamenei's picture right on the top. Uh, a little smaller picture of Sistani next to it, but a little lower. And Iraqis don't like that. Iraqis will go and tear those off because uh, Iraqis will have their own posters with Sistani a little above. They'll actually totally uh, miss out on, on Khamenei, uh, but th there are posters on the uh, on the walls at many a times. So there, there's this tussle that is going on, but this tussle is very historically very theological. Um, without taking your time into taking you to a religious <coughs> internal Shia debate, but just to explain, you might have heard the word Najaf versus Qom. And it's, it's Najaf versus Qum, yes, but in a very scholarly arena. There is this power struggle of sorts, but in a very nuanced scholarly sense. It is not about power grab. Yes, those in Najaf were always very clear. They were against the idea of Velayat e the, the rule of the jurist, because the Iraq, Najaf was always saying, politics, keep politics on the side. They're very secular in this sense. They always said, religion is your relationship with with the Lord, um, politics, leave it to the politicians. One of the great seminary graduates, Ayatollah uh, Rula Khomeini, of course, challenged it. 
and he said, no, this is the rule of the jurist. The time has come for the Iraqi, for the Shia religious scholar to come and take the reins of government in their own hands. That's why Vilayat Faki. And this, so that debate and tussle is going on. But if you go to Najaf, you can visit during these uh, tours across the city, the house where Ayatollah Khomeini had lived and studied. Um, that the Iraqis have not kind of uh, closed it down. The Iraqis really respect um, uh, the, the tradition and the scholarship of not only Ayatollah Khomeini but many others. So the scholars between Qom and Najaf are coming and going. It's not a war, it's not a battle between Najaf and Qom. It's, it's a scholarly uh, discourse. At times it becomes serious. Now the view is many people think what will happen um, in the next stage when because the process of selecting the Maraja, the, the Maraja, the top grand Ayatollah, they're all four grand, but one is uh, uh, kind of more supreme. Um, they, they get they, they control the, sh the shrines, so a lot of uh, uh, money comes from there that is used in major charity works and others. And the concern is, okay, who will uh, be the next? And the process is so complicated. If you're interested to know more about how a Marja is selected, uh, there's an excellent series of tweets actually by a scholar, Kazvini. Um, he's one of the cousins. I mentioned the Kazvinis. He's one of their nephews uh, based in uh, Najaf now. Um, he's trained in uh, American academia. Um, so you, you, when you hear him, you think you're talking to an American scholar. Um, he wrote a series of tweets on how a Marja is selected. It's very, very complicated. Some people think Iran is gearing up that whenever the opportunity comes in one year, five years, or 10 years, or 15 years, um, the next person in place of um, Ayatollah Sistani should be the one who is very friendly to Iran. That, that's some people. So one deeper level discussion is whether it is that battle which is going on. Uh, it will not be a bloody battle in that sense. It will be a scholarly battle, but that has a huge impact. Because Ayatollah Sistani's role in modern day Iraq is huge. Without him, frankly, there would have been no democracy the way we see democracy today. Um, and it just reminds me of a quote from Professor um, Feldman, um, who is at Harvard Law School, asked him. And, and he has said this in one of his uh, articles as well. Um, he was part of the team. If I know you're recording it. I hope I have to be very accurate what I'm saying. Uh, Professor Feldman and some American scholars had gone to Iraq in 2003 to help Iraq build a new constitution. So American scholars had taken a ready-made constitution. This is, we gift you along with other things. This is the new constitution of Iraq. And Ayatollah Sistani said one word, no, you cannot impose. You're talking about democracy. <coughs> you cannot impose a constitution on us. And he said, one man, one vote. And Iraqis will decide and declare who, who, what is the new constitution. And that's how it was pushed. And people like Professor Feldman and others, they said, oh, wow, that, that's amazing. And they created no trouble, they came back, told the President Bush, oh, they, they are on the right track. And that's how the constitution was built. This was not recognized because of sectarianism <coughs> within Middle East. And I must say this, uh, many of these things, the amazing things that happened in Iraq, uh, other than their constitutionalism, also, the way Iraq was opened for pilgrimage, and the way um, those of you have had a chance to be there, I can talk in more detail maybe later on, at, uh, on about the pilgrimage routes in Iraq. They have done an amazing thing uh, by not only security for these pilgrims, but also the way um, in Najaf and Karbala, the shrines are expanded, the services, they, they have done a phenomenal job. And that's not often recognized globally, uh, because we think of Iraq still as a war zone. So that's, but coming to my uh, Najaf versus Qom, that's one other uh, deeper layer of analysis I wanted to introduce you to. Um, then comes the political elite that in, in Iraq, how do we understand that? Current Prime Minister, Adil Abdel Mehdi, uh, I had a great honor to meet him, one of the smartest politicians that I had a chance to uh, meet. Uh, we had organized a uh, conference actually in Iraq many years ago with him. And uh, he comes across, he was, I had a great conversation with him because he was one of the very, very few Iraqis who could speak excellent English. And we had interviews rather than through interpreter, we talked directly. Uh, he is he's a, from Shri background, but he was a Baptist. Uh, he worked with Saddam. Uh, he is from a very important tribe uh, in Iraq, very powerful. Uh, he was also a communist for some time. Then he joined a very pro-Iran group, was used known as Sisri or Iski. Uh, the the uh, Bakhil Sadr's uh, 
no, no, not Bakir Sadr. Uh, Hakim uh, family, they were very closely aligned with them. Uh, and now he's there, he's not a member of any party, but two of the big, biggest new political alliances, one led by Muqtad al Sadr, other Hadi al Amri, they all thought Adil Abdul Mehdi is the best bet. And within a few months of his taking over as prime minister, all of this has happened. And strangely, no one was expecting initially, I think, that who supported him, who at this moment, who wants him to continue as prime minister? Not Muqtad al Sadr, maybe not Hadi al Amri, yes, but primarily Iran. Who is the contender to become the next Prime Minister? They put in a new name, the intelligence chief of Iraq. That was pushed aside because Iran said no. So Iran is huge influence. Iran has influence in Baghdad, no doubt about it. But there is that debate. Uh, if Adil Abdul Mehdi is gone, he's, he's an Iraqi, he's a, not only an Iraqi nationalist, he's a relatively very capable man. But there is this larger political elite. And the, it is important to understand many of this Iraqi elite today is, if I may dare compare them with the Afghan elite, they were mostly out of Iraq during the Saddam era because of the Saddam Hussein's absolute brutality. Uh, we have chosen to forget about the chemical weapons that Saddam Hussein had used, uh, the brutality, the killing that he was in his regime had perpetrated. But many people had left, they had lived in Iran or where else? London, uh, England. So the Daba party, which was in power in Iraq, so the local Iraqis say this new political elite that has come out, they come and tell us, oh, you are the guys um, who couldn't, you couldn't stand against Saddam. And the locals would say, you lived in London, you lived in Iran. But there is not a severe tussle, but these are new two elites. Local Iraqis who think they lived, they stayed under Saddam, lived through that brutality. And others who had left, of course, the why US was back, in, uh, in Iraq, we know of the story of a few Iraqi Americans who have played a very, very important role convincing the Bush administration, no, you can go in. Um, Chalabi, um, where is Chalabi buried? He's dead. He's dead, that's why I'm saying, where is he buried? In a very important place. I leave it for you to research because that tells you something, where he's buried. He's buried in the shrine of uh, one of the most celebrated Imams in Baghdad. Those who honor him, they say, he, to be, even walk through those corridors is different. To be buried in a major shrine, he's in that vicinity. He was not an Iraqi, Iraqi per se, but he, many Shia would say, he's the one who helped us, who, this is a political issue, some people hate him, um, but some love him. Um, and there is a reason for that. The point I'm making is larger than that. The point I'm making is, this is the new elite in Iraq, which was so unstable, that they thought the only way they can survive is through corruption. So many of this political elite is now deeply involved in corruption. Um, and that, that's an issue that has really disappointed uh, and disoriented uh, the ordinary people. So they, that's why they're saying we are Shia, we are the biggest beneficiaries of all this, but we are not going to take it anymore. I mean, that, that's <coughs> also what deeper level analysis. So they're not saying, oh, this is just because of my politicians happen to be Shia and I'm Shia, that I'm going to love him? No. If there's no hospital, there's no education, I'm not going to allow that to happen. There's that debate as well. So I know I've gone longer than what I thought. I'll just conclude with two slides what all this means. So this is a new space. I don't know whether this is Iran, this is US, this is Saudi Arabia. It may be all of these. Everyone is trying to cook their own dish in Iraq today. But you can't take the credit away from the ordinary people. They're not coming from Mars. I mean, they're, they're the local people who are seeing dead bodies still coming out every day. Young people who have no other hope, who can't look at anything else. They said, okay, we'll die for it. So it is giving expression to a lot of um, creativity. This is their reciting poetry. This is a new public space where ordinary Iraqi thinks I can express myself. Um, uh, in, in so many different ways, um, through calligraphy, through poetry, um, and that, that's what is important. And last but not the least, is this, uh, this is one of the messages, we still don't know who really controls these protests, but the Iraqi constitution will be written here. This is one of the posters, this post, exact translation <coughs> of this poster. I mean, I hope this was obvious. All the English things I was reading were translation of the banners. 
the Iraqi constitution will be written here, an invitation to specialists in the fields of law and political science, those who, who are experienced and educated, to attend the constitution writing gathering in Tehrir Square on this, this, this date, 11th, 15th of November. So this is giving space to ordinary Iraqis to take things into their own hands. I think that's the best thing. At the end of the day, it will not matter whether the US is doing something or Iran is pushing back or the Saudis are doing it. It's the ordinary Iraqis. So I'll end on that positive note. I'm really convinced um, that this, this um, expression uh, is the sign of strength of Iraq. Um, at least, at the least, that, that's what I hope so and many of the people, the well-wishers of Middle East hope so. Thank you very much.